yes. I'm telling you, I wouldn't want to be any other place than right here. Right. That's true. They had, they had some spirit there in Washington, D.C. today. That was nice. But this is the place to be because Arizona is ground zero for the struggle for rights and liberty. Arizona is. It's the front line. The struggle for justice. I must say that I've been so deeply moved by my experiences today here. And when I got off the plane and I saw Brother Pablo and Brother Carlos and Brother Chris. I knew it was going to be a long day. I've had about the truth. I had about six hours of sleep in the last three days. And I'm a 57 year old, Jesus loving, free black man. I said, No, I feel belong here. And they took me over to the committee to defend the barrier. Looked in the eyes of my dear Latino brothers there, waiting to be picked up. I had a brother explain to me his situation, his plight of predicament. He wasn't a mere victim. He was doing victimized, but he wasn't a mere victim. He said it with dignity and integrity. I have a strength and a fortitude. He said it in Spanish, but I accepted the translation. <laughs> Went on to Esperanza School. I saw the very precious young brown brothers and sisters, Latino brothers and sisters, study. We had dialogue. I said to myself, that's why I came. Out of a quest for unarmed truth. And I understand truth in the following way, the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. Don't talk to me about any truth. If you're not allowing the voice to be lifted, a set of voices to be lifted, to come to terms with the suffering, but never allow the suffering to have the last word. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, then I went on to Tony T. F., the Embassy of Indigenous Peoples. And I was introduced to the talking circle with a ritual. Wonderful incense all around me. And I could feel the spirits of the ancestors That's right. saying, fight on. That's right. Don't cave in. Don't sell out. Don't give in to despair and despondency. We've been going for thousands of years against the vicious legacy of white supremacy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We drove out to Tent City. I want to take a look at my brothers and sisters out there. I could see them through the barbed wire. I said, this is what America needs to see. This is what we need to focus on. All of the various forms of suffering taking place so that people will be able to to break out of their little bubbles and begin to create coalitions and alliances and say, in the face of greed, in the face of bigotry, in the face of resentment and revenge, we want justice. That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. Then we went to the park. You all got a lot of green grass and fingers. <laughs> New Jersey does too, but you wouldn't know it if you lived in Newark, <laughs> or Trenton, or Camden, because there's a lot of suffering in those chocolate slices too. Yeah. Yeah. They're at the health care to run by young people, disproportionately young Latina sisters. And this issue agenda is very important, because the last time around we tried to create a movement to for justice, we had too much patriarchy in the world. We got to make way for the flowering and flourishing of sisters of all color. We can't have a movement without the sisters of all color. At the health care, I saw the young sisters running things. It's my 
And when it comes to trying to tell the truth about America, it's difficult. Because America is unique among modern nations. It moved from perceived innocence to corruption without a mediating stage of maturity. Woo! Oh! No other nation in the world believes it's innocent. Even my dear brother Barack Obama in his race speech talking about slavery was America's original sin. No, get it right, brother. It was a subordination of our precious indigenous brothers and sisters and their babies and their land. Get it right. Get it right. Slavery was number two. Oh, yeah. That's white supremacy with devil faith. That's right. But let's tell the truth. That's right. Let's keep it funky. <laughs> Don't live and die for something. You don't want to be part of a sanitized, sterilized, deodorized discourse. You won't know what the truth is. So yeah. yeah. true of the individual life. To live your old deodorized life, preoccupied with stimulation and titillation, thinking that to be human is just to have material prosperity and some kind of living large in a vanilla suburb. How superficial can you get? I don't want that spiritual malnutrition. I don't want that emptiness of the soul. I want something real. I want something concrete. We know the relation between spiritual malnutrition and moral constipation. Uh, I have such deep respect for my dear sister Mary Rose Wilcott. Give her hand. Give her hand. Brother George Dean and Eula Dean is here somewhere. I don't know, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. His family, there they are in the back. There it is. Right. Urban Lee President. Right. Urban Lee President. Good to see Mark Mario there at the March 4. Race and liberty is for our brown and Latino brothers and sisters. But moral constipation is becoming hegemonic. Yeah. Oh. Knowing what's right and good, you're just stuck and can't get it out. <laughs> moral constipation. Too much greed. Too much bigotry. Too much resentment. Too much revenge. Too much cynicism. Too much cruelty. That gets in the way. And that's been the history of the country. Mm -hmm. F. Scott Fitzgerald, our dear Irish brother, used to say that Test of a first-rate intelligence, the ability to, to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Yeah. When you think about America, that's what you have to do. Right. Mm -hmm. Most people tell you America is just about democracy, liberty, opportunity, and possibility. You say, for who? <laughs> There's a truth in it. There's something grand about democracy for me. Those sly stone call everyday people. Amen. Across the board, they deserve dignity. They deserve voices to be heard in the decision-making processes and institutions that guide and regulate their lives. That's democracy and its grandest project. America began as an empire. It was a corporation before it was a country. Amen. And greed, land, Power. We have to be able to keep both projects in our minds at the same time. It's a difficult thing to do. George Washington called America an infant empire. Thomas Jefferson called it an empire of liberty. Alexander Hamilton said it was the most interesting empire in the world because it denies that it's an empire even as it engages in imperial activity. That's right. Denial, denial, denial. According to the U.S. Constitution, how are indigenous peoples characterized? Savages. How are you going to characterize them as savages when they're the ones lending an open hand and you come in swinging? Yeah. Who's barbaric? Who's bestial in behavior? 22% of the inhabitants of the 13 colonies. 
enslaved Africans, their labor will be the very economic basis for the possibility of U.S. democracy along with the subordination of indigenous peoples and their precious babies allowing for the land base. That's right. Now how are you going to have a constitution that doesn't even refer to the institution of slavery? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You end up fighting a civil war over an institution not recognized in your constitution. <laughs> That's mendacity and hypocrisy. Yeah. That chicken's coming home to roost. You reap what you sow. It's in the war, it's gonna come out in the rent. No lie can live forever. That's right. Truth. Capital T. None of us have full understanding of truth, capital T. We're in quest of it. But anytime we reach a moment of crisis where the suffering becomes so excessive that we have to respond out of our complacency, out of our apathy. We have to have persons like yourselves who muster the courage to say, I want to know the truth about myself, about my country, and about the world. Yeah. That takes courage. It's awakening that takes courage. Shatter the narrowness. We saw it in the 1960s. Here comes Brother Malcolm X. Unequivocally zeroing in on white supremacy. Oh, don't mention that word. That, that, that's offensive. <laughs> oh, but the Jim Crow and the Jane Crow and American terrorism that's wounding and scarring black people is not offensive to you? Are you so well adjusted to injustice? Say that. Amen. Repeat that. That you can't see it? Are you so well adapted to indifference? It doesn't mean anything to you? No, we won't talk about the truth. It was true in the 1930s with our precious working peoples with the bosses so tied in the greed that the whole system collapses and they still want a system guilt tilted toward the strong. And our working people said, no, we're going to organize. Argentina's had the right for workers to organize, organize since 1836. We don't get it until 1936. Argentina's not known to be on cutting edge for social justice. <laughs> What's going on? We got some bosses, we got some oligarchs on Wall Street, you got some elites in big business that are so obsessed with profit and greed and money and status that when it comes to the precious humanity of working people, poor people, indigenous people, peoples of color, they turn their backs in difference. The great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say, indifference to evil is more evil than evil itself. But you can't get at the evil if you're not concerned about it. If you don't care, you have no concern whatsoever. And it's a moral choice that any human being can make. Yeah. We're not just talking about the interests of people. Of course, our Latino brothers and sisters, indigenous brothers and sisters, poor, whatever, they have interests, yes. But we're here to connect their interests to the principles that motivate all of us. We're concerned about their humanity. We're concerned about their dignity. We're concerned about their integrity and learning from them how they've been able to sustain their struggles in the face of so much coming at them. And what has been coming at them? Well, the underside of the American project, the imperial side of the American project is what? Terrorizing people, traumatizing people, and stigmatizing people. The history of white supremacy in America. Yep. Keep these people so terrorized, keep these people so traumatized, and keep these people so stigmatized that they all want to walk around with their back humped over scratching when it don't hit you laughing when it ain't funny. Wearing the mask, apathetic, not believing in themselves, not wanting to organize, not wanting to mobilize. No, oh, Brother Martin used to say, any time oppressed people straighten their backs up, they're going somewhere because folk can't ride your back unless it's big. Straighten yeah. up. Take a stand. You see a brother play the organ every first Sunday, Sunday in my church, Shallow Baptist Church, named Sylvester. He's known to the world as the genius that he is, Sly Stone. He wrote a song called Stand. That's right. Stand, in the end, you'll still be you. Yeah. 
When he done all the things you set out to do, stand as a midget standing tall and the giant beside him about to fall. Stand, you've been sitting, you've been crawling much too long. There's a permanent crease in your right and wrong. That's Sly Stone, 1970. <laughs> 2010, 40 years later. Man. Who's gonna straighten their backs up and take a stand in the face of people who are being terrorized, traumatized, and stigmatized? All right. Oh yes, that's the fundamental question. The fundamental question. And it's a question that affects each and every one of us on a moral plan, plane, and on a political and personal plane. Yes, what is being done now to our brown and Latino brothers and sisters in the face of terror and trauma and stigma is the catalytic issue. But that same set of strategies is easily transferable to other folk who fit the state, the scapegoat of the day. That's why brown brothers and sisters have much to learn from we black folks. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. We've been dealing with terror yeah. and trauma yeah. and stigma yeah. in the U.S. Democratic country. Yeah. And it's been vicious. Yeah. But in the face of terror and trauma and stigma, what did black folk do? What did Emma Till's mother have to say? Amen. When she stepped to the lectern in Robert's Church, Robert's Temple Church of God in Christ, south side of Chicago in August of 1955. Y'all remember who Emma Till was? Yes. That precious young black brother in gut bucket Jim Crow, Mississippi. Yes. Cowardly white supremacist, cowardly American terrorist. She killed a brother, sliced his body into pieces. She found the body in the Tallahatchie River, brought it back to Chicago. She stepped up to that lectern. She looked at all of the cameras there. She said, we gonna keep this coffin open. We wanna see the terror and the trauma and the stigma in America. She said, that's my only baby, that's my only child. His father fought in the U.S. Army. She stepped to the lectern and she spoke on behalf of the best of black people, brown people, yellow people, red people, yeah. white people, any kind of people. She said, I don't have a minute to hate. I will pursue justice for the rest of my life. Yeah. Don't have time to hate. No. You terrorize me. You're not going to create a black outside. I'm going to hold off on that option. We're not going to counter-terrorize you. We will defend ourselves, yes. We won't counter-terrorize you. Just like Frederick Douglass in the face of slavery, we want freedom for everybody. In the face of Jim and Jane Crow, we're not going to Jim and Jane Crow others. We want rights and liberties for everybody. That's the moral dimension. That's the spiritual dimension. You can't have a movement talking about justice if you don't have a strong moral and spiritual dimension that can keep you going when your back is against the wall. And, it, and let's be very clear about it. November does not look good. The forces of greed, forces of bigotry are getting stronger and stronger all the time. Too many folk are complacent. Not enough people standing up. That's right. That's Tea Party movement has no monopoly on organizing and mobilizing folk. Wait till we wake up and see what happens. Wait till we begin to wake up and see what happens. You're gonna see thousands thousands and hundreds of thousands of but it doesn't look good at the moment that's not news anybody who loves poor people and loves working people knows often it doesn't look too good you just have to be a long distance runner you gotta be a long distance you got to be able to Tell the story how under Reagan, greed was viewed as so good mm. that it was the desirable way of being in the world. Right. The way corporate elites and big business 
financial oligarchs and big finance began to loot private pockets and government when they in trouble. Billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. At the same time, they were doing what? Demonizing poor people. Right. That's right. So at the same moment in which the free, the invisible hand of the so-called free market was at work under a corporate agenda, there was the iron fist of the penal state with billions and billions of dollars found to expand a prison industrial complex that began to look more and more like the new Jim Crow. Don't have money for school, don't have money for health care, don't have money for job centers, but you got new prisons going up all the time. Then you start privatizing your prison. You want to make money on your prison as if these prisons parties are just disposable human beings you don't care about. We here to say we care about this. And this debate that's been taking place in the nation, but especially every day, is an extension of that indifference and that greed. It's just that it's now intensified during the age of Obama as opposed to the age of Reagan. Yeah, that's right. The age of Obama was 1980 to 2008. And the only reason it came to a close was because Katrina put a nail in the coffin of the Bush administration when you had precious black bodies in the Superdome reminding people of slave ships with those precious black bodies part of those 52,400 voyages, folks said, oh Lord, these black folks still catching hell after 400 years and you can't get to it. The most powerful government in the world can't even save its own citizens. What is going on? What's going on? Then at the other end, you had Wall Street collapse. Greed got so intense that even you had dissensus and conflict among the greedy. <laughs> you got five billion, I got seven. I'm gonna get nine. What about your workers? Well, their wages have been stagnating for 30 years. Productivity going up, wages stagnating and declining, poverty going up. How long you think your democracy is gonna last with that kind of class division in place? So the Republican Party began to implode. Thank goodness. And here comes a decrepit, spineless Democratic Party. Oh yeah. They've been complicitous with their attack. It was under Clinton that he signed the welfare bill that even Reagan wouldn't sign. It was under Clinton that he signed the Crime Act. Right. The priest takes you out mandatory sentences. That's Clinton, that's saxophone playing Clinton. <laughs> under Bill Clinton that you undercut the Glass-Steagall Act so you got investment and commercial banks coming together so banks no longer concerned about lending they just want to trade on the stock market to make big, 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 big money right. and yet right. when they fail, when they collapse they don't say the same thing they said to the welfare system, pull yourself up by your own bootstrap, no they said here's 700 billion dollars to help you out nothing but welfare at the highest level what hypocrisy can you get? What kind of it do you think? I mean, it's amazing. You may have been born at night, but not last night. Don't insult our intelligence. Too big to fail. Does that mean that everyday people are too little to rescue? I lost my house. I foreclosed. Bankrupt is on the horizon. Can I get help? Pull yourself up. This is America. Yeah. It's success or failure. Tell that to the investment bankers at the top. Oh, no. But at the same time, this is a problem. This is why I'm glad you raised the question, Brother Barack Obama, because what Barack did, of course, was he sidestepped the Clinton machine that was at the center of the decrepit Democratic Party. And there's some decent folk in the Democratic Party, don't get me wrong, it's just that they're not running things. <laughs> they members, you know. They marching them. But Rock comes along, nobody knows who he is. He gives a speech in 2004, 
says, America's a magical place. I turned to Mother Tabitha and smiled. I said, this brother's going to have a Christopher Columbus experience. <laughs> He's going to discover America and realize, my God, I'm encountering folks here. I've been lied to. America's a magical place. Ain't nothing magical about America. <laughs> The only reason we have a democratic project alongside our imperial project is because persons like yourselves in the past were willing to muster the courage to be critical, to fight for public interest and common good, something bigger than us, something that included all of us. And if we don't fight, you're going to lose it. That's why the last sermon that Martin Luther King Jr. was going to give the Sunday after he didn't know he was shot, but it would have been the Sunday after he was shot. He wrote down on a piece of paper. He said, I want to preach in my own pulpit in Ebenezer Baptist Church in A-Town. We didn't say A-Town, he said A-Town. <laughs> what do you want to talk about, Martin? He said, I want to talk about America may go to hell. Amen. That's what Martin said. He didn't say America should go to hell. He didn't say America ought to go to hell. He said America may go to hell. How come, Martin? Because the escalating poverty and the greed, because of militarism, both here and around the world, especially for him in Vietnam, because he was a black man who loved Vietnamese babies. Because of the materialism, the market culture was so hegemonic that life was fundamentally about trying to get over. Everybody obsessed with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> Corruption, gangster proclivity, push button success, down, downplaying of discipline, downplaying of courage, downplaying of service. Everybody just wants to get over now. Be a celebrity for 15 minutes and feel good about yourself. How empty. Martin, he could see the future of America. He said it, 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 it's tilting more toward the imperial pole than the democratic pole. Look like I've been sacrificing all of this time. 72% of Americans disapproved of Martin King. 55% of black Americans did. That's a sign that is never a function of just skin pigmentation. It's a moral choice that you have to make. Brother Barack made his move, and I supported him critically too. Did 65 events for that brother from Iowa to Ohio, because I wanted to bring the age of Reagan to a close. I wanted to curtail the scapegoating. The Clinton machine collapsed, here come Barack, with that beautiful smile. <laughs> I won, I won. <laughs> yeah, beautiful ears, beautiful ears now. Got it from his beloved white mother and his Brilliant African father. But the challenge was what you're going to do in the midst of catastrophe, multiple catastrophe. And the first thing he did was pick an economic team that came straight out of Wall Street in terms of influence and worldview. <laughs> Dyton, Summers, Goldsby, none of them have a history of being concerned about working people and poor people. In fact, Two of them were responsible for the deregulating of the derivatives and the markets under Clinton. You say, Brother Barack, what are you thinking about, brother? He said, well, maybe the people who helped get us in the mess can help get us out the mess. Plausible, not persuasive. <laughs> you can't find progressive economists that look at the world from the vantage point of working people and poor people. We notice in your administration you don't even mention poor people. It's all about the middle class. Who you think the middle class actually is? Middle class ain't nothing but working people with a bourgeois identity. That's all it is. They just working people. Miss three checks and see how middle class you are. You part of working class. You're walking around like you so bourgeois. Experience some downward mobility and be broke as the Ten Commandments financially, part of the new poor. And you say, Oh, my American dream was betrayed. Lo and behold, you were working class from the beginning. You were just... <laughs> Barack, money's running out. Here come Afghanistan. $161 billion this coming year. 
Can't find the money for other things, but you find money for that. Oh, that's an imperial side too. Why you wanna occupy Afghanistan? That's the cemetery of empire. Ask the Russians, ask the British. That's right. They kill everybody. Well, we wanna kill Bin Laden. You already, already dropped three times as many drones on Pakistan than Bush did. Bin Laden just wrote a note yesterday. That's right. Talking about his vision. A lot of well. And Bin Laden's a gangster, we know that. <laughs> but America's had its gangsters. Yes. Saddam Hussein is America's gangster. CIA put him in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He turned on America and he said, oh my God, he's a gangster, you don't say. <laughs> Probably the only leader put in by the CIA and at the top of the FBI list at the end of his life. That's what happens to empires. When they don't have moral consistency. And that has everything to do with why we're here in Arizona. Because this larger context of trying to get people to deny the suffering of persons across the board is a dominant strategy. And if we can put at the center of who we are those who are experiencing the most intense form of the terror, the trauma, and the stigma. Just take a look at 10th City, you see. Take a look at Palomino, you see. It is connected to the black pool, tied to the new Jim Crow and the prison industrial complex and dilapidated housing, the disgraceful school systems and depression-like levels of unemployment. It's so easy to pit black folk against brown folk. Oh, yeah. that's an old yeah. divide and conquer yeah. strategy. Yeah. Oh yeah, we know about that one. We know about that one. Oh, yeah. And it's real. It's real. People are struggling. to get getting access to slots, limited slots, pitted against one another. We've got to have leaders, followers, activists who can point out the larger story so that people don't end up scapegoating the most vulnerable but come together and confront the most powerful. That's what we're about. That's what we need. That's what we have to have. And yet we can't do it if you don't decide to be a long distance runner. I'm going to bring this to a close. I want to end on the blue note. I told y'all the blue note. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Ellison, the author of Invisible Man, used to say the blues ain't nothing but an autobiographical chronicle of a personal catastrophe expressed lyrically. That's what it is. It's a lyrical response to the catastrophic. That's right. And the king of the blues, B.B. King, said, nobody loves me but my mama and she might be jiving too. <laughs> That's the blues. That's the down gut bucket blues. Why? That's no love, no care. But just look at our children today. Those precious brown children I saw at Esperanza. The black children locked in the chocolate city. The poor white children in Appalachia. It's catastrophic. Billy Holiday so talked about the strange fruit the southern trees bear. That's That's right. The catastrophe of American terrorism called Jim Crow. The Jewish brother Maripol writing the lyrics. What do you do in the face of catastrophe? You don't drink from the bitter cup of bitterness, or you don't become paralyzed like a blues person. You keep on pushing, as Curtis Mayfield would put it. Somehow you've got to muster the courage to steal, quest for the truth. Somehow you've got to muster the courage, like Emmett Till's mother. Not to hate, but to pursue justice, not revenge. Somehow, we've got to muster the courage to have hope. But I didn't say optimism. Optimism is a mainstream American construct and product. Anybody who loves poor people has no grounds of being optimistic. <laughs> Down through the quarters of time. And right now, look what we're up against. That's right. But you can be a prisoner of hope. 
That's different than being an optimist. You can be a veteran of hope because you have to stay in motion. You've got to create momentum and you can't do it by yourself. You can't do it in an isolated manner. It has to be a coming together, a bringing together, creating that kind of momentum and maybe in the end we can create a social movement. Then that is in the end the only thing poor people and working people have in the face of 13,700 lobbyists who spend $3.5 billion shaping Congress, shaping the politicians, the kind of legalized bribery and normalized corruption that we see so often in politics and even in our criminal justice system. We can get down and out when we look that truth in the face, and but like a blues man or woman, you say, yes, we see the catastrophe, but at the same time, we do not allow it to have the last word. That's why these kinds of coming together are significant. Do we have what it takes here in Arizona? Absolutely, precisely because you are not alone either. I'm coming back. We're going to bring some other folks back. We're not going to allow our precious folks to be put against the wall. We're going to sing the blues with a smile. We're going to keep love in our heart. We're going to struggle for justice. And we're going to change America and the world, linking with Asia, Africa, Latin America, to create a new world. And then tell our indigenous brothers and sisters, we haven't forgot about your suffering. We haven't forgot about your struggle. Thank you so much.